Hello, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Numbers Around the World, an eMarketer podcast made possible by M Particle. It's Tuesday, April the 19th, and I'm your host, UK Principal Analyst Bill Fisher, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to Around the World with Digital's Disruption of Video. Welcome, folks, to a Behind the Numbers show that takes you around the world looking at what various countries are doing in the worlds of commerce, media and advertising. Each month, I give you a quick fire global news recap, giving you insight into some of the biggest stories that we've seen around the world in the past month. Then I speak with a couple of our seasoned specialists to get their take on the main theme for today's show, which is all about digital disruption of the video mainstream. We'll be asking how public service broadcasters can compete with the global streaming behemoths? The question is whether it can compete. And we come now down to the size of the purse, you know, for all of these players. It's very unlikely that Channel 4 is ever going to have pockets as deep as Netflix or Amazon. How ad-free digital video options are disrupting things for marketers. The headline is that the market is very hot. It's growing massively in Canada, despite the fact that most streaming in Canada is done through subscription video on demand. And what the connected TV advertising landscape looks like. So, before I introduce my first guest, let's dig into some of the biggest stories from around the globe this month in our segment 3 in 3. I have three minutes to cover three of the most interesting news stories we've seen in Around the World Towers this month. The timer is set. Let's go. For the first story, we're going global. And we're making our own news this month with our inaugural forecasts for TikTok ad spending going live in the past couple of weeks. And this news made quite a splash around the world for good reason. We estimate that TikTok's worldwide ad business grew 175% in 2021 to $3.88 billion. Growth will then soar to 200% this year propelling revenues to $11.64 billion. That means its ad business will be greater than Twitter's and Snapchat's combined. TikTok is also nipping at YouTube's heels. By 2024, the end of the forecast period, TikTok's ad revenues will swell to $23.58 billion, essentially equivalent to that of YouTube. By then, each company's share of the worldwide digital ad market will be 3.1% TikTok boom. For the second story, Chinese fast fashion retailer Xi'an is in talks with potential investors for a funding round that could value the online-only retailer at about $100 billion per reporting from Bloomberg. That valuation would be more than the combined value of notable fast fashion retailers H&M and Zara, which operate thousands of physical stores. It would also make Xi'an the world's most valuable startup per CB Insights. Xi'an sales have soared throughout the pandemic thanks to customers' evolving behaviours, its partnerships with creators and celebrities, and its unique business model by which it steadily pumps out small batches of items every day, then ramps up production based on their popularity. The retailer's sales more than tripled in 2020 to $10 billion, making it the biggest online-only fashion brand in the world. Its holiday sales soared 103% during the 2021 holiday season, and were up 477% compared to the same period in 2019. The new funding round reflects that rapid growth. Its two previous funding rounds in January 2019 and August 2020 valued the retailer at 5 billion and 15 billion respectively per Forbes. And for our third story, we're in the UK and talking about the government's stated plan to sell off the public service broadcaster Channel 4. The channel, which has been broadcasting in the UK since 1982, is publicly owned but commercially funded. It is not in receipt of public money like the BBC, which derives funding from the TV licence fee. Fully 90% of its revenues come from advertising and 100% of those revenues are pumped back into the UK's creative economy. It doesn't produce its own programmes in-house. Rather, it commissions them from more than 300 independent production companies across the UK. However, none of this seems to have convinced the Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sports, Nadine Dorries, from pursuing privatisation for the channel. 
She claims that the sale of Channel 4 would allow it to be better able to compete with the Netflixes and Amazons of this world. The question is, should that be the purpose of a regional public service broadcaster? That's my three and three this month. And we're going to dig much deeper into that final story with our first guest today. Karen von Abrams is our principal analyst for Western Europe. Hi, Karen. Hello, Bill. Great to join you. It's great to have you. And you know what's coming next, don't you? I do. I, I fear, as usual, that there is an awkward question heading my way, but um, let's have it. Okay. I think I've made it a bit easier for this month. It is my Britishism for the month. Now, th- this one's actually stretching things a little bit. It's probably, strictly speaking, not a true Britishism per se, but it's a word that I think when I mention it, most people in the UK should know what I'm talking about, and hopefully you will too. Elsewhere, not so much. Let's get into it. So, Karen, if I were to say to you the word Corrie, C-O-R-R-I-E, Corrie, to what would I be referring? Well, first of all, I must say bingo, the first probably historical question in this segment that I have ever been able to answer, if I recall correctly. Cory is a term of endearment for a long-running soap opera called Coronation Street, set in one street, not surprisingly, in the Midlands, if I am not mistaken. And Karen, um, you're doing so well. It, it is indeed Coronation Street. It's set in the northwest. It's set in my old neck of the woods, uh, a suburb of Manchester, oops, actually. <laughs> oops. I've sabotaged myself again. <laughs> anyway, well done. Absolutely right. Coronation Street, or Corrie, as it is affectionately known, is, is actually the longest running soap opera in the world as recognised by Guinness World Records. Uh, The first episode aired on December the 9th, 1960, so its 60th birthday was just a couple of years ago. In that time, on the show, there have been 146 deaths, 57 births, 131 weddings, and 28 women in Ken Barlow's life. Ken Barlow being the last remaining character on the show who appeared in the first episode. It's set, as I mentioned, in a bleak English fictional town, of Weatherfield in Greater Manchester in the northwest of England, and it follows the daily lives of the residents of Coronation Street. And it would likely never have seen the light of day on a platform like Netflix or Amazon Prime. Yet the show continues to attract significant viewer numbers, with each episode pulling in around 6 million viewers. There are currently three episodes per week, so that makes a combined audience, according to my quick maths, of about 18 million each week. And in 1987, one particular episode of the show drew in more than 26 million viewers, one of the most viewed non-event related televised programmes in British history. It airs on one of the UK's ad supported public service broadcaster channels, ITV, which, like Channel 4, gets all its revenue from commercial interests. So, Karen, we might come back to Corrie in a minute or it might come up as part of this particular conversation. But I want to start with Channel 4 and this idea of privatisation. I touched briefly there in the the new segment about the government's reasoning behind this move to privatisation. What's your take on this? Well, I should say that many observers, many industry analysts, and indeed other people with an eye on the general TV landscape here in the UK have speculated that if this does go ahead, if Channel 4 is sold to the private sector, it will be very largely motivated by political reasons. It has been said that, for example, there is no reason to privatise, it's already ad-funded, it will be detrimental to the creative economy that you mentioned, composed of all of these independent production companies, if the channel is privatized because it's very unlikely that the same amount of money from the advertising would go back to those companies that currently provide programming. There would be an imperative rather to bring in profits, to pay shareholders, and that's likely to disrupt what has been a very successful model. Let's put it that way. It's also true that especially of late, Channel 4 has been known next to the BBC for relatively independent, unbiased coverage of political events and other developments here in the UK. And the Tory government has not been very happy about that in many instances. Okay, just to play the devil's advocate for a moment, though, and I, I don't like to side with Nadine Dorries, but Channel 4 generally, I mean, I spoke about Corrie there drawing in 18 million viewers per week. Channel 4 doesn't really 
have that many programs that draw in those kinds of numbers you know that viewership is much smaller on channel four doesn't the government have a point that you know it's now up against these global digital streaming players that are pulling in millions of viewers is there anything to this idea that that channel four should be allowed to compete with these global streaming players I don't think there's any problem with the premise that Channel 4 should be allowed to compete. The question is whether it can compete. And we come now down to the size of the purse, you know, for all of these players. It's very unlikely that Channel 4 is ever going to have pockets as deep as Netflix or Amazon now that the merger with MGM is going ahead for Amazon, for example. These are global players. Channel 4 is never going to be global. And therefore, there is an argument that insofar as viewers in the UK may want global programming, non-UK providers are always going to be perhaps ahead in the race for that. And if it's UK-focused programming, there's not so much reason that Netflix, Amazon, Apple and other players are going to be providing that. So I would still think there are strong arguments for not going ahead with the privatization based on that, you know, purported advantage. And I I guess one of the questions as well is, should it compete? Because it's a completely different beast. And, you know, the government has made noises about shaking up the BBC as well. Obviously, just to reiterate, the BBC is license fee funded. So everybody who watches TV in the UK has to pay a TV license in order to watch any broadcast TV channels, including the commercial channels. And so the BBC gets all its, well, it it does have some commercial interests abroad, but in the UK, it gets all its funding from the license fee. The government is looking to shake that up because it it often says, you know, is is the average UK consumer getting value for money from that fee. But I know we spoke in the prep for this call that you sort of talked about what is the purpose of the BBC and Channel 4. And it's not just to provide hit dramas or movies. It has many other facets, right? Why don't you explain a little bit about that setup? Yes. I mean, the BBC, like public service broadcasters across Europe, France and Germany are other good examples was founded with the intention of providing not just entertainment, but also informative and unbiased coverage of all kinds of things. So they're extremely well known for their nature programming, as well as for their news. They have a very wide range of radio stations and other offerings, which have now gone online, as well as being in uh, more, more traditional formats. So It is not a completely different set of priorities, but it is interesting that the unbiased nature, the objective nature, which has always been part of the BBC's clear remit, is one shared by public service broadcasters elsewhere, including France and Germany. And it does tend to be part of the BBC's foundation, which is under threat from particular political interests. And I was noticing that this, again, is happening in France and Germany in particular. There are battles about funding public service broadcasting, and it is chiefly, not to put too fine a point on it, people on the right end of the political spectrum or on the right side of the political spectrum who are most outspoken in saying that all license fees should be ditched. Marine Le Pen in France has been campaigning. One of the elements of her platform is that she would cancel the license fee there, privatize public TV, public radio. Another right-wing politician there, Eric Zemmour, is very much in favor. Uh, Macron, in an effort to appeal to voters in France has said that if he's re-elected as president there, and there's an election coming up on the 24th of April, so very imminent, he would also scrap the license fee. This is an appeal to consumers, and this argument applies in the UK as well, that a license fee of over 100 euros, or in the UK, 159 pounds for a colour TV license for a year, is an additional burden on consumers that are very hard pressed at the moment with rising energy prices, rising fuel prices, just a a very alarming inflationary spectacle. So there are many, many political factors involved here. 
Yeah, uh, funny to hear you mention a colour TV licence as well. I can't believe that people still own black and white TVs, but apparently they do. Okay, finally, I just want to sort of flip things around a little bit and come at this from the, the global streaming platform's perspective for a moment. And I mentioned when I spoke about Coronation Street, this is a programme that is regional, something that a Netflix or an Amazon probably wouldn't produce because it. I guess they would perceive it wouldn't have a wide enough appeal. But I, I know that there are remits for these streamers to produce local language content, for example, in, in some of the markets that it operates in. How are some of these global streaming companies going about providing more appealing content to regional audiences? Well, as you say, it's been a key part of the thinking of big global players like Netflix and Amazon as they've tried to expand beyond the English speaking market, especially in the US. In France, which has historically been quite protective of its own culture, of French language culture, there have been rules in place ever since the streaming players came in that a certain proportion of what they are licensed to show in France must be in the French language. And as it happens, Netflix has just turned on the green light for, I believe, another seven series or programs to be done in the French language during the coming year. In Germany, there's been a similar trend, although the Germans have not historically been so keen to impose specific rules and quotas on streaming players. So, yes, I mean, it's a big part of the appeal of the larger streaming platforms as they try to consolidate a presence in Europe. This is also getting harder and harder, of course, because during the course of the pandemic, as we know, both normal TV broadcast viewing went up. The streaming platforms also did incredibly well. It turns out, according to Ender's analysis, some data just out, the TV viewing figures have tended to fall off as we move into theoretically a sort of post-pandemic or a, you know, a new normal period. But the streaming platforms have kept up their quite good viewing figures. On the other hand, Netflix and other global players are not growing very rapidly in Europe at the moment. And that's a worry for all of them. That's partly the motivation behind acquisitions like Amazon's of MGM. It's why Netflix appears to be going into gaming now to try and build up a larger audience that may combine a group of people who are interested in both online gaming and also Netflix other content. So slow growth is really on the minds of the non-European based streaming players going forward. Yeah, maybe they should look to create the next Coronation Street. I won't hold my breath. Karen, that was a fantastic discussion and we could talk for longer, but sadly that's all we have time for for this segment. Thanks very much for chatting. Thank you for the invitation. We are going to hear from our sponsor now, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back to discuss connected TV, amongst other things, in Canada. At the end of the day, your customer has to be at the center of everything you do. This starts with the right customer data strategy, as well as the right foundation to solve the challenges that typically inhibit success, such as data quality, data governance, and connectivity. MParticle is your real-time customer data infrastructure that helps you accelerate your data strategy by cleansing, visualizing, and integrating your customer data from anywhere to anywhere. Ultimately, better data leads to better decisions, better customer experiences, and better outcomes. See why the best brands choose MParticle. Go to www.mparticle.com. Welcome back and welcome to our next guest. As promised, we're going to be talking about CTV and other things in Canada. So it can only be the man himself, our principal analyst for Canada, Paul Briggs. Hi, Paul. Hey, Bill. It's great to be back on the podcast. Great to have you. And uh, are you a, a curry watcher? I believe that it's quite big in Canada. It is quite big in Canada. I have not watched much of it myself, but I know a few family and friends who are committed watchers. I think the last numbers that I saw were more than a million Canadians watch episodes of Corey, as you call it. So, uh, yep, it's it's got a great following in this country. Great. Okay. Well, Karen and I just had a very interesting discussion about Corey and other things, but about the public service broadcaster landscape in the UK and how that's being disrupted. 
let's kick things off by maybe you could just give us a, a lay of the land of how things look in Canada in this regard. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, that the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the CBC, is uh, much like in the UK is sort of a, is a bit of a political football in terms of what opposition parties want to do with the CBC. There's a lot of calls for defunding the CBC, reducing the burden on taxpayers to fund it. Um, that comes from one side of the political spectrum. They also argue that it's an instrument of the federal government and it's not objective in, in reporting in the newsroom on what's happening with the government. So there's lots of discussion about the validity of the CBC as a news organization, as a cultural producer of content, a broadcaster that also does a lot of sports. So very much like the BBC in, in the UK, it's, uh, it's pretty central to the programming culture in Canada. Is it funded in the same way? Is it license fee funded? It's funded through direct funding from the federal government. They also have advertising revenue. So CBC Radio 1, Radio 1 is the uh, the CBC's name in Quebec, the French language CBC. is So the radio portion of CBC Radio 1 is ad-free, but there are advertising dollars collected for TV program and for their growing podcast business. So they have a whole roster of podcasts that they produce, some that are derivative of the radio programming that they make. So they are collecting ad revenues as well. They also have sub subscription fees. So they have services like CBC Gem, which is a streaming service where they have a two-tiered pricing on that. So you can do an ad-free version of CBC Gem for a fee every month. So those are the primary ways the CBC is funded, but the bulk of it comes directly from, from federal government funding. That's really interesting. So the, the CBC Gem, I think you said that's the streaming service. Is that is that what I've understood? That's yep. correct. So yeah. And there's two-tier pricing. So does it, when you say two tiers, there's the subscription part of that. Is there an ad-supported part that you don't have to pay for? Yes. So there's a free version and that is ad-supported. And the uh, if you want to go with the CBC Gem premium service, you pay a, you pay a monthly fee. Okay, that's really interesting. So, yep. so in the UK, ITV, independent television broadcaster, has just launched something similar, ITV Plus, and it used to be ITV Hub, and it, it's kind of rehashing it. So it, it had the same kind of structure. There was a two-tier structure, ad-supported, and then you could pay a subscription. It's kind of re-pitched it to try and make this sound more appealing. I'm, I'm interested, so interesting that you talk about CBC Gems ad supported part of the, the company there. What does the broader ad supported video on demand market look like in Canada, AVOD? And, and I, I wonder also if you could, I promise we talk about CTV, mm -hmm. how much of that is, is consumed via connected TV? Right. So we are producing our first CTV forecast, connected TV forecast for Canada just this spring. So we're going to have a report coming out in the next few weeks that's going to outline just how much CTV ad spending there is in Canada and how that compares to linear TV. The headline is that the market is very hot. It's growing massively in Canada, despite the fact that most streaming in Canada is done through subscription video on demand or SVOD as the acronym goes. So Netflix, Prime Video, Disney Plus, Apple TV Plus are all SVOD services where no advertising revenue flows through. The AVOD or ad supported video on demand sector is, is still growing. It's not like the US where there's a multitude of AVOD players or ad supported players. In Canada, that's not the case. However, we have seen some moves. Discovery Plus, for example, launched last fall in Canada with a two-tiered pricing system. So higher price for ad supported, lower price for uh, ad free. So a lot of the people in the industry are looking at that launch to see how well it's accepted by the Canadian consumer. And if it is accepted well, I think we're going to see more AVOD players enter the market with a two-tier pricing structure. In the end, though, the amount of ad spending on CTV uh, next year is going to exceed $1 billion. So it's a growing market. It's competing for dollars against linear TV, and it's really following the consumer trend to consume big screen content through connected devices like smart TVs, like gaming consoles, or a connected device like Roku. Wow, one billion Canadian dollars. So that sounds like quite a lot. Is proportionally is that quite a lot spent? It's about equal to next year it'll be about equal to one third of the total linear T V market. So okay. those two dollars are they're they're mutually exclusive, those two buckets of ad uh, revenue. But the C T V number is about a third the size of the linear T V ad number. Yeah. And and what is included 
in that CTV number. Can you give us a little bit more insight into that? Sure. A lot of it is YouTube advertising consumed on a connected TV device or smart TV. So that's a big part of the CTV number, but it's also ad revenue that flows through ad supported video on demand platforms. Like I mentioned that Discovery Plus is one example. Also the big broadcasters in Canada like Chorus, Bell and Rogers have video on demand services in their platforms that they also classify as CTV as well. So if you're on a connected device and you're on Bell's Crave service, let's say, and consuming content, if any ads that appear there would be, be included in the CTV service or C- yeah. CTV ad number. Okay. I'm a, I'm a little bit disappointed, Paul. You In the prep for this call, you said that the CTV market was sizzling and you've, <laughs> you've not used that word. I, I prefer that description. Anyway, um, obviously it is. It's sizzling. It's hot. There's something there. I, I, I want to just pivot very quickly to talk about the large multinational global streaming providers and Karen and I spoke a little bit about how they are trying to cater for regional audiences what does that look like in Canada are they producing regional content for different parts of Canada obviously different language speakers in Canada as well yeah so it's following the same trend that Netflix for example is pursuing around the world which is developing local content the unique part of the Canadian story is the federal government's insistence (laughs) to Netflix that they do this. There's a big push in this country to protect sort of cultural identity uh, through entertainment. So Canadian content is valued in Canada and is a public policy uh, priority. So that led to, in 2017, Netflix struck a deal with the federal government in Canada to invest $400 million in programming over five years in Canada. So they met that target pretty quickly. I think it only took them three years to do it instead of five. They are committed to local content that includes French language content filmed in Quebec. They've made acquisitions of films and programs in Quebec that they that they air on their platform. I guess air is not the right word, stream on their platform, showing my age a little bit here, Bill. But um, yeah, so that, that French language content is growing in Quebec for that particular segment of the population. But a lot of Netflix shows are filmed and produced in Canada as well. Awesome. Okay, Paul, brilliant. That was great, but I'm afraid we've run out of time also. Thanks for taking some time out to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Bill. And that's it for this month's edition of Around the World. Thanks again to my guests, Karen and Paul. Tune in tomorrow for the next Brand Anatomy podcast with Jeremy Goldman. If you want to ask us any questions, you can, of course, email us at podcast at emarketer.com. Now, I'm not on the airwaves quite as often as Corey, and I probably don't have quite the same audience reach, but I do hope to see some of you next month for another edition of Behind the Numbers Around the World. Bye for now.